All right, fam, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just wanted to say what's up. My name is Mitchell. Uh, some of my friends call me MJ down in the ATX area. Um, and I lead our college ministry at a church called the Austin Stone um, in Austin, Texas. Um, been there for a little over three and a half years. Before that, I was at a church in Lubbock called Redeemer. Probably met a lot of those folks um, around here. Uh, really loved them a lot. Um, uh, but yeah, um, I uh, just kind of want to get to know you guys uh, for a second before we kind of kick off this session. First off, thank you for coming to this session. There are a lot of um, incredible speakers and breakout topics and all of that like in this building. So um, yeah, I just really appreciate you guys being here. It also shows that you have a heart um, for this topic. Um, at least there's something there. Um, so I uh, would love to start with you, my guy, and we're just going to snake around. So once we get to the back, we'll go from the back to the front. Um, but we'd love to know name, uh, just so all of us can hear, um, and then what church you're with. So, and then you can go right after another. I'm Jacob, and I'm with Fredonia Hill out of Nagados. Yeah, let's go. Awesome. I'm Brooks. Stephen at Boston, Nagados, Texas. Nice. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Reese, also a student at Boston, also a student at also a student at Texas. Hey, love y'all's leaders. They're, y'all are super blessed yeah, yeah, with them, for real. Yeah. I'm Lisa, I love y'all so as well. As well. Yeah. Um, my name is Sol. I live in San Antonio, work at the Church, GGTS Education. Heck yeah. I'm Rosie, and I'm a First Baptist Church in Lake Jackson, Texas. All okay. Over yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Glad you're here. <laughs> I'm Seth, and I'm with Hillcrest Baptist Church in Cedarville. Okay. Uh, I'm Lena, and I'm with Cardin Avenue in Bethel, Texas. Mm-hmm. I'm Sonia, I'm also with Cardin Avenue in Bethel, Texas. Come on. I'm Brandon, and I'm also with you. Nice. Awesome. We'll go to the back at you. I'm in a church called Point in downtown Fort Worth. That's great. I'm Russ, and I'm with a church that's in a town just outside of Oklahoma City. Mm-hmm. I'm Matt, and I'm at Redeemer Lovett. I'm Jeremy. I'm with New Beginnings and Walt. Mm-hmm. I'm Luke. I'm also with New Beginnings and Walt, too. I'm Jordan. I'm with uh, The Well in San Marcos. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, the church from the video yesterday. Yeah. Um, it's really awesome. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, again, thanks for being um in this breakout session. And yeah, the topic is reaching forgotten groups on campus, developing, you know, sub, sub kind of point, developing a heart and strategies to see groups of people on your campuses that most ministries ignore. Um, so this was kind of more of a, um, how do you say, it? this was kind of more of a kind of subconscious heart that I feel like I had um, early on in my, like, days of being a college student um, in Lubbock, Texas, at Texas Tech University, Reckham. Um, and uh, I don't know, we, when you go to campus, you just have all your different groups, you have all your different cliques, you have all your different types of people, and then um, sometimes our churches kind of become that way um, in some way. What's up, y'all? Uh, wait, name what church you're with. John, from Morrison Heights. Nice, glad y'all are here. Um, so yeah, uh, so so even when you get into like uh, how our different churches kind of look and operate, or even the personalities, we're like uh, a lot of times very homogenous. Um, I know that's some of what the hottie was preaching about um, this morning, uh, and um, sometimes there there's a lot of beauty in those things, but um, also we kind of get to form habits that don't look like the habits. Um, of Jesus and how he did ministry. So um, here's a story, and I got permission from one of my best friends and my associate director, Addie um, McIntyre. Uh, maybe some of you guys have met her. Um, uh, she, uh, this is something that we've talked through since she was uh, a resident and then even like how we were trying to form the heart of our ministry. But when she was in college, uh, she was in a sorority, um, and she was also a part of a ministry that like just focuses on reaching sorority and fraternity students, which is awesome. Um, praise God for that. Um, and uh, as they would kind of do their weekly Bible studies, um, uh, she would just like meet people and just invite whoever to those Bible studies. Uh, so she invited one of her um, next door neighbors 
uh, to a Bible study and eventually started discipling this girl. And then somewhere down the road, she came to start following Jesus, which is incredible. Um, but this girl was not a sorority girl. Um, so one of the things... Uh, one of her leaders kind of in uh, that ministry organization um, talked to her about, just pulled her aside after the first time she brought her to the Bible study and was like, hey, like, this is awesome that she's here, but don't forget the mission, because their mission was, like, reaching sorority girls, um, and this girl didn't fit kind of the mold. Um, and uh, so fast forward all the way to last year, and something I do with my staff is once a year, uh, we'll bring in, like, some, like, college ministry, like, you know, guru or person or whatever, uh, and then, like, just bring them in and, like, tell them everything that we do. They tell us everything that we, we do, um, or they tell us everything that they do, and then um, we'll just have them critique the mess out of the stuff we do, and it's partially an experience for, like, um, my staff team to get used to asking for help, but also asking for critique and welcoming it and not feeling like personally attacked by every type of critique. Uh, but also um, it's so that we can maybe see things in different perspectives. Um, and uh, what's so interesting about it is that the person I brought in was the, one of the regional directors of the ministry that she was a part of um, in her college days. And one of the critiques that we got, but also one of the things he praised was that um, it's so incredible that y'all like have a heart for all of these different things, but that's just not our thing. Like we want to kind of like focus on like this one group of fraternity and sorority uh, people. And um, and afterwards, uh, uh, Addie came to um, our office space and like had to meet one on one with me and just started bawling. Uh, and more so bawling, like, out of sadness, maybe because of those experiences that she had in college, but also out of joy because of the fact that she now gets to work for a local church where it's like, we don't get to divide the heart of God up. Um, and so that's like a key difference between, like, what maybe a parachurch ministry, which is a branch of the church still, and should still be connected to our local churches, that's something parachurch ministry gets to um, really pick and choose. It's like what we're going to focus on. And I love that. Um, and obviously none of us can do everything, but we can all do something. But the thing about the people of God and God's church and our local churches is, is that we must have a heart for all types of people because that's God's heart. Um, we don't get to pick and choose what our majors and minors are. If God cares about it, we need to care about it. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to do everything because you're limited and you're a finite person, but um, you do have to care about it. Um, and I just say, I'll, I, I kind of start with that story to say is because um, not to, you know, throw shade at any type of strategies with college ministry and stuff like that, but it's commonly stated in college ministry circles to go after those with the most platforms, stardom, fame, um, and influence. This uh, is kind of from an article online. I'm not going to tell you where I found it from uh, because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but uh, it's just more of an example. And they talk about this principle of win a chief, win the tribe. And it says, this is part of the people group concept that missiologists finally discovered in the mid-20th century. To try to win the tribe before the chief is convinced will backfire, but if he makes a genuine decision, then the whole tribe will be responsive to making a decision also. I saw this so clearly when I was witnessing to a group of 10 college students in a Ukrainian dorm room. They listened closely, but when it came decision time, they all took their cues from the leader of the pack. He hesitated to commit himself, and then one by one, I saw the others follow suit. Um, I get like the idea behind that, but... Um, I, there's no scripture that we have to back this up. Um, I think if we look at the life of Jesus, if we look at all four gospels, if we look at the book of Acts and how Jesus raised up leaders, how he called up leaders, um, who he searched out, it like the strategy um, doesn't make sense if you're living in a biblical worldview. Um, but because of our westernization of the American church and our practices and our strategies, uh, we somehow have kind of like, adopted this kind of strategy. Um, we've adopted the fact that, oh, like, 
oh yeah, I'm going to try to go for the quarterback of the football team. And I'm going to spend all my energy to do this because if they can come to my gathering, then everyone will come. Um, and that's really great for like getting a ton of numbers, but it is not close to Jesus' heart. It is not close to Jesus' heart. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I want us to not substitute faithful ministry to marginalized groups or fringe groups or forgotten groups. I don't want us to substitute that faithful ministry with strategies to just grow things. Um, Because you can have a ton of people that are maybe influenced by a few, uh, but none of them are actually faithful to to Jesus. They're actually coming for those influential people. Um, And so... When it comes to even thinking about marginalized, so I'm going to use that word a lot. Um, and I want to make sure we understand what that means, especially as we look at these uh, texts in the Bible. Um, but margi- a marginalized person or person or group is treated as insignificant or peripheral. So peripheral, think of your vision, your peripheral vision. You're not really paying attention to it. You know it's there, but like it's not your focus. Um, that's what a marginalized person group is, or a fringe group, or a forgotten group. The people that you forget are the people that are actually there, but you're not looking at them. Um, so what's so awesome about this is I don't have to make up any stories about uh, Jesus, Jesus' life to like kind of like try to convince people of the fact that Jesus goes towards the vulnerable that Jesus goes towards the forgotten um, uh, in society and his culture. Um, I can just go to the text with you uh, because I have nothing good to say in and of myself, but we know that um, God's word um, says a lot um, about the marginalized. And yeah, that's what we should look to. So, um, so first off, Jesus and children. Uh, David Platt has this really um, incredible quote. He says that even when Jesus' disciples saw children as a nuisance to be avoided, Jesus saw them as a treasure to be welcomed, to be received, to be loved, and to be cherished. So in Matthew 19, 14, I know like for us, like we're like, oh yeah, bring on the kids. We love the kids. Kids are adorable. Um, uh, you know, people who aren't parents apparently say that, uh, like me. Um, but I, But in this day, like, yeah, children were a nuisance. Like, even the disciples were like, hey, like, let's keep these kids away from Jesus. Who knows what they're getting into? Um, but Jesus says in Matthew 19, 14, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Um, so even like the most annoying, like, like kids are welcome to come to Jesus. Jesus wants them to come to him. Um, then we also see Jesus and women. Um, a lot of this uh, is even seep deep into the cultural um, identity of, uh, of of Jewish people in this time. So uh, we see Jewish, um, we see Jesus and women in first century Palestine. Um, how it's unusual for men outside the family to address a woman in any way. Um, but Jesus did things very differently, right? Um, he sat with a woman at the well, who was not just a woman, but she was also a Samaritan. We'll talk about that here in a second, uh, why that's so important. Um, but he also interacted with Mary when she poured perfume on his feet. And when he healed the woman with a bleeding disorder, he calls her daughter. He calls her daughter. So not only is this a woman who's grabbing this, uh, like, quote-unquote, random man's, like, garment, like in the midst of him going to heal someone else. Um, but also she has a bleeding condition, which like when you think about Old Testament law, like that would make you what? Unclean. So you think of someone holy, they should definitely not be involved or communicate with or even uh, be touched by someone like her. But Jesus turns to her, looks at her, calls her daughter. Jesus did things very differently from uh, the surrounding culture um, in welcoming, inviting people who were on the fringes and marginalized by society. Um, then Jesus and the diseased. Uh, lepers are among the most stigmatized people in Jesus' day because of the disease that came with so many horrific consequences, um, including exclusion from society, from family life, uh, disfigurement. Uh, Lepers were literally ostracized, but 
In Mark 1, when the leper approaches Jesus to ask for healing, Jesus does something profound. He says, moved with pity. It says, moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Jesus touched this person who people didn't want to get within a mile of. Jesus touches this person. He's so different than anybody else who's ever lived. Um, And then we see uh, Jesus and the Samaritans. Like I was saying earlier, uh, you have the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, um, which is so incredible. But uh, we also see Jesus making um, a Samaritan uh, man, a person, the hero of a story where there is um, Jesus uh, being approached by this Jewish lawyer, and the lawyer um, talks about like fulfilling the commandments, entering the kingdom of heaven, and all these different things, um, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says, all right, go do it. But the lawyer replies, well, who is my neighbor? Um, and Bible translations always say, you know, in parentheses or something, uh, desiring to justify himself He replied, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus gives a story about the good Samaritan who's basically on um, a walk and sees a Jewish man um, who is on the side of a road, beaten nearly to death, um, has been robbed. And there was already a priest and a Levite who passed by. So think about this. It's like if you had like your lead pastor and an associate pastor or something like that, you were like beaten up on a road, left for dead. Those two dudes pass you by. This is literally what's happening there. Um, And so they're passing this Jewish person by who is a part of their lineage and family and heritage, um, but this Samaritan who is supposed to be their enemy, who is someone that they want to very much keep away from. This person becomes a hero of this story. Jesus was intentional with the fact of making this the story of the good Samaritan. Samaritan is someone who's half Jew, um, half Gentile. Uh, they're, they're a mix of both, but they were definitely ostracized from Jewish culture. Um, these two groups hated each other, but Jesus makes them uh, the hero of this story. Um, and so it's even showing more and more and more hints of like a bigger kingdom um, and how Jesus' um, perspective of the kingdom is and who it should include. Um, then, uh, yeah. Jesus identifies with the marginalized. And I think this is the last kind of long scripture um, in this setting. But, um, and I'm just going to let this scripture uh, speak for itself. Matthew 25, 35 through 46. Uh, Jesus says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. And I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did you see, we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then He will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not, um, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Um, Jesus is identifying himself with the peripheral. He's identifying himself with the margins. He's identifying himself as the person that is marginalized in our society. Um, And I think that that is something so beautiful to be the king of the universe. So one that um, literally spoke everything into existence and to identify himself with the lowest of the low in our world. That's what Jesus does, though. And I think our solution, um, I I mean, you know, our main solution uh, is remembering that for ourselves. Uh, The root issue of our lack of obedience to these texts is, basically a gospel amnesia, forgetting that 
not only that the gospel come to you, but that it's for you and it's the thing that sustains you. Like we've forgotten that God's taught us how when we're strangers, when we were foreign, when we were enemies, we don't just get to point the gospel to people who are lost, but we must remember it for ourselves that we would still be lost if God had not found us. We would still be lost if God had not gone a far way to grab us. And they all, that's the gospel. That Jesus lived the life that you and I should have lived and died the death we should have died. Um, but Jesus lived the life we should have lived in a sin-stained, fallen, broke-down, busted world that we made bad. And he came from the comforts and the beauty of heaven, like willingly down to live, die, and rise for us. Um, and he calls us to do the same. We were far out on the margins. You think about holy and unholy, like y'all, we were gone. But God sought us out. So we must remember the gospel. And once we actually remember the gospel and receive that in humility, that Jesus came for us and that's how busted we were, that God had to send himself down for us, um, I think we're more willing to go out and give the gospel away and go to the margins. Um, Jonathan Edwards says that ministry to the poor is a crucial sign that we believe the gospel. It's a crucial sign that we believe the gospel. And obviously the poor and marginalized groups, like I don't want to group all of those uh, people together, but what the Bible talks about when, it talk, when it's talking about the poor, a lot of times it's relating that to other um, marginalized groups. It's relating it to the groups that are unpopular, the groups that are not seen. So the truth is, that when we see Jesus going to the forgotten in this context to invite people into discipleship, to relationships, uh, and spiritual leadership, uh, we see that he chooses straight up ordinary people. Like there's like nothing like, like, like awesome about these people. Um, in the book of Acts, when the Pharisees and Sadducees are like kind of like looking out of a window, basically. I don't know if you know the uh, meme with like Squidward kind of looking out a window and seeing SpongeBob and Patrick running around. Like that's kind of how I think about this passage. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees are like at the window and they're like, what are they doing down there? And the disciples are just running around doing miracles, like seeing people saved, baptizing people. Uh, and what they say to each other is like, they're just ordinary people. How are they doing all this? And, but that's God's plan. That's God's plan. That's his strategy. Jesus is like, give me the 12 most ordinary people. Give me the most busted, broken people to be around and heal and give the gospel to. And like, I will change the world. It's because of the gospel going to those people that all of us in this room have faith. Like, think about that. But if we were to line up the 12 disciples amongst a a bunch of other kind of nice Uh, well put together, you know, personalities are like the best type of personality type of people in a room. We wouldn't choose the 12 that Jesus would choose, would we? I don't think we would. (laughs) Um, And so uh, I, I want us to, I want us to be more like Jesus in that way. And I not only think our churches and our ministries would benefit, but we would experience, um, so much gospel fruit when we have a church full of different types of people that are coming together that wouldn't come together in any other context. Like it, like it's so crazy. Like even when you think about people who are in the sports and the stadiums that are all filled up, these are all people that love sports, but like the kingdom of God should be all different types of people. And we should have strategies and um, we should have a heart that reflects the fact that God is calling every single type of person. Um, So D.A. Horton says, uh, if we do not actively pursue people who are living in the margins of society, then we can easily remain aloof to their existence and will have marginalized awareness not only of their existence, but also of Jesus's practice of distributing mercy. We must be in the habit of pursuing those who live in the margins to show them that God has not forsaken them. Um, God has not forsaken them. If um, a person still has breath in their lungs, they can uh, receive the gospel and come to know Jesus and become um, some of the greatest like workplace missionaries or international missionaries or whatever. Um, and I think that that's what's so beautiful about the gospel. And the same thing uh, that God has done with us, he can do with whoever. So 
based on all of these texts and even more that I could have read from the New Testament, um, what if our, the most faithful call and strategy that we had was actually going to seek the people who are forgotten, the people who are on the margins? Um, there's a ton of ministries to the Greeks, but who are going to reach the geeks that are in the corner, right? That are like not willing to come. Um, my wife does ministry to athletes. Uh, and one thing like I was talking to her about is like, who's going to reach the mathletes though? Um, and it was just like funny. I was like, I'm going to the Baptist conference. It's like, I'm, I got to find things that run. Um, but, uh, but really like when you see those types of people come to your ministry and some of those people are, don't look like what you quote unquote think a leader should be or an influencer should be or a herald of a, the gospel should be, uh, what does that say about uh, what we believe about the power of God? It says that we think God is weak, that God can't use people based on the preferences or biases that we have. Um, so if God is the most powerful um, being, person in the universe, and he can use anybody in any space, any situation, any personality um, to be a steward, herald, uh, missionary. Um, so, um, funny story. Um, uh, well, I'm not going to share the funny story because that will take too long, but I'll do a different story. Um, actually, Matt um, knows this guy. Uh, I'm about to give a story about Cam, actually. And uh, Cam was a student in our ministry uh, back in Redeemer, um, and everybody freaking loves Cam. And Cam is always everywhere. I don't even understand it. Um, everybody knows him, just popular dude. Um, and then, uh, so Cam is on the Asperger, or is on the, um, he has Asperger's, but I know it's like on the autism spectrum now, like to actually say it in the right way. Um, but uh, when he uh, started serving in our ministry, he applied for leadership. And it was around this time of the year where a bunch of our um, staff just gets in a run and where we just kind of make our leadership decisions and deliberations. Um, and the last person we got to was Cam. Uh, and it's because we've never been in a situation where we're like, okay, what do we do with like Cam? Do we give him a leadership position? And then like, like some of us starting, some of us like we're just kind of wrestling with like, okay, would this do more, uh, hurting than helping or, you know, but God can do anything. So like, let's like just do it. And, uh, it took us a bit to really kind of get a gospel foundation of like, what we should do in this situation, um, because Cam was in personality way, it was so different from the rest of our student leaders. Um, and so we just sat and just prayed and asked God to just show us what to do. And it uh, led to um, me having to break a tie basically between a room. Um, and we like brought Cam on the leadership. Um, and we had to really kind of get to the bottom of what do we think a Christian leader is? Like, what do we think like, it means for someone to herald the gospel and give it away to other people or to lead someone in a Bible study or to follow up with someone um, over coffee. And what does it say about us um, if like this person has no like character flaws or moral flaws, like when it comes to like getting this type of leadership position, what does it say about us if we don't go all in? with him and like bring him on the leadership. So uh, we did that. And there were so many like funny stories and like funny things that happened. There's like one in particular that like, dude, there was a thing with the group meet. I don't know if you were in that. Do you remember what I'm talking about at all? I'm just like, this is one person. I'm like, we could talk about it later. But there was like a funny thing that happened with the group meet. And uh, it was an adjustment for Cam and it was an adjustment for us. But our uh, ministry looked more like uh, the ministry that I think Jesus had in mind um, as Cam came on. Um, and I remember, uh, walking with, um, Landry, one of our residents at the time and Cam, um, and us figuring out, okay, like who's going to be the people that Cam goes to reach. And so we started talking and Cam and came out of his mouth. He was like, like, like I can like reach other people who are on the autism spectrum. And the fact that God took that out of Cam, like that was Cam's heart because we didn't know if we wanted to like like actually ask him if that's like who he wanted to reach because we didn't want to put him in a box. But he was like, no, like, like God has like given this story to me so I can like go reach other people. 
Um, and so that was just such a beautiful thing. Um, and then also thinking about things like homeless ministry in our church during um, the beginning parts of the pandemic when we started meeting back up again. Um, our congregation at our church meets downtown um, in Austin, Texas, and we're usually out of high school, and we can be in high schools during uh, the heat of the pandemic. Uh, because even no schools weren't meeting. So um, we had to find a way to start gathering again. So we gathered at this outdoor kind of like bar place called Stubbs Barbecue downtown. And uh, you've probably like seen the barbecue bottles like at like HEB or Market Street or something like that. Um, and so we started gathering there. And then um, down the road, like three, four blocks away was I-35. We were in the midst of like being in some of the worst um, type of in the worst level of homelessness that um, Austin had been in years. Um, and this was not like because of anything started by me or any of our like staff at our church, but as our students were walking over to our church, they came and asked like, hey, there are some homeless people down the road. And like, like, could we invite them into our gathering? And I was like, yes, please go and do it. Um, and they started inviting the people who were experiencing homelessness from um, under I-35. And there were two specific um, people, a man and a woman, who stuck with our congregation since we've moved in so many different places. Um, and we got to celebrate one of them. Uh, she came to know Jesus in the back of um, a couple students' cars. <laughs> and she gave up her crack pipe as she, like, started following Jesus. Like, true story. And one of them called me and was like, what do I do with this? And I was like, bro, I don't know. <laughs> like, like throw it away, obviously. But, like, I, I don't know legally what we should do with this. And, um, and now I just got a call yesterday. Um, because we're still like working closely with her. And so like me and a couple deacons were like talking yesterday and um, she's almost like at the point of uh, being able to move into um, a like, it's called Community First Village. It's like a homeless um, community, tiny home community for people experiencing chronic um, homelessness. But that started because there was something um, in some of our students' hearts to like reach the people who are just right there down the street. Um, and so there's so many things um, I can talk about, but um, I also know that coming to something like this could like really like put a lot of things on your radar and make you want to do everything. Just know that you can't do everything. Um, uh, but you can do something. Um, and I think the amount of time that Jesus talks about um, being near the margins and seeing people and talking to people that most of society didn't interact with or give value to, it says something about his heart. Um, and so uh, I love how um, one of uh, our pastors set, said it um, during a sermon one time, but um, when he was talking about uh, Luke 10, actually, in the uh, Good Samaritan, uh, it's like he said something like the world, uh, the world takes care of the powerful already. Um, God wants us to take care of the vulnerable. And I thought that that was beautiful. Um, and I wish I would have said that the first time I did this breakout. Um, but hey, it is what it is. Um, so uh, a couple things before we land the plane and just kind of open it to question discussion and like we can talk together on different things that we're experiencing because I don't want to make this too specific because Austin, Texas is totally different than all the different places that you're from. So um, what it means to be someone on the outskirts of your ministry or your church or your city is going to be probably different than anyone else's. So maybe people that come to mind for you will be different, but uh, groups that can, groups can be forgotten due to their uh, race, um, Gender, uh, sexual attraction. Um, this is like just pausing even right there um, because I know like this conference has like a group of people who are all, you know, maybe in different places with even understanding what it means to um, like serve people uh, who experience same sex attraction and who have experienced that their entire lives. Um, the truth of you know, the gospel starts with the fact that like God is all good um, and then we. Uh, we brought sin into the world, and now our bodies are broken with everything else. Um, and so uh, because of that fact, um, even uh, attraction is broken, and some people just experience same-sex attraction. Um, and a guy that I've discipled for a couple of years um, and is becoming like one of my really good friends, um, he has always experienced same-sex attraction. 
Um, and one of the first times uh, that we met before we kind of met with our entire discipleship group, uh, we just walked through his story a little bit. Um, and something that he wanted so bad was for our church to be a place to where um, where anyone who's experienced whatever type of experiencing whatever type of sexual attraction uh, can come in and not feel isolated, but feel loved and welcomed into this family. Um, so uh, really, like, as we started talking about it, I was like, dude, like, this is something that I have not experienced. So like, it's, going to be hard for me to understand what it means to like lead out in this way. And I was just like, bro, like, will you like help us do that? Um, and so we're about to start the summer discipleship program uh, this, this summer, but he was an intern with us when we did it last summer. Um, and he helped us lead um, this book study our church was trying to start walking through called Rethinking Sexuality. Um, and it's so good, um, so Bible-centric, um, and it's such a good conversation starter for like how we think about sexuality. Um, and he opened it up and he gave his story to all of these different people. Um, and it just really like blew the door open uh, for us to have a broader conversation um, in our church and in our ministry. Um, and then also what that did was it brought two other people who was going, who were going through that summer program with us forward who had been experiencing those things like for all of their lives, but never knew how to talk about, it, never knew if the church was a safe place to bring those things there. Um, so now we have a group of college students and a group of some of our lay leaders who, um, are people who experience same sex attraction, but want to be faithful to Jesus, um, and are walking closely together with each other while also teaching our entire congregation what it means to welcome the outsider in in that way. Um, because yeah, so I can say so much about that. Even I can talk about, you know, how like, evangelical churches talk about dating and marriage and like how it's glorified sometimes and but like just know that groups can be forgotten based on like um their sexual attraction um obviously there's things like age but we're all doing college ministry stuff so obviously there's give and take there um physical ability uh language um this is why i told luisa i'm gonna give her a shout out here luisa is right there in the blue um and uh she's one of our students in our ministry uh, she's gonna be a summer intern with us um starting on monday and she just starting early i guess um and uh something that um her and a couple other students and one of our residents andres uh, came to me um, about like early in the year was just trying to start a Spanish speaking MC um, stands for missional community and um, I remember having like so many talks with Andres because originally that was supposed to be a community like to reach one specific university in Austin but after more and more conversations with him um, and seeing his heart Andres is from Colombia um, uh, seeing his heart and catching that vision for it, I was just like, bro, all right, go for it. Like, like, let, let your people loose. And then Louisa, uh, became a leader for it. And then we have so many other people, uh, who came in and wanted to lead with it. And, um, now it's one of our most, uh, beautiful, like, like, just physical um, iterations of community that we've seen um, at the church that I've seen in my time doing ministry. Um, and it's because of something that God placed in Luis's heart that I was like, yo, amen. Like, praise God that God is giving you the Holy Spirit and you see this need based on like your experience, your friendships, your family, and you want to meet that. Um, so uh, things like language, um, things like immigration status, even thinking about the fact that Jesus himself like had to be a foreigner and a stranger. Um, and we gr these groups can be forgotten. Um, and obviously there's so many more. And churches can forget about um, different types of people like creatives, right? Like the creatives in our congregations, people um, who maybe do full-time um, uh, artistry, uh, people um, who uh, are media curators, people who kind of work in these types of jobs, um, they can sometimes feel underutilized and not seen and forgotten by churches. Um, we need to give them lanes um, to lead and to serve um, that also uh, that also kind of show off their gifts and how it can be used for the glory of God. Um, then you also have like people um, who have mental health issues and are mentally unstable. Like, man, even thinking of uh, different personality disorders, things like bipolar disorder, um, things, uh, oh my gosh, my mind's blinking. Um, but 
just thinking of the amount of people that are dealing with so many things, like, is there some reason why some of these people don't enter our churches or stay there long? Like, are there reasons why, like, somebody who's really struggling with their mental health and obviously get a licensed therapist, like, bring that person in uh, as you need? But, like, is there a reason why we kind of throw our hands up sometimes or just like, ah, oh, it's too hard, I can't do it? Um, I, I think that um, what Jesus says is so true, that the church should be a hospital for the broken. Um, and so people who are really struggling, uh, especially uh, in the past couple of years uh, with their mental health, they should feel welcomed and seen and loved um, by our churches. Um, then you have people who are unpopular, you have people who are loners, but to kind of really close out here, um, as you kind of think about those people for you, um, here's another way to think through, like thinking through it like, like via your campus. Um, because there's seven types of different student organizations. It's not just, oh, you got athletes, you have Greeks, and, uh, but you have so many different types of orgs. And the cool thing about this is that, like, some of the students in your churches and your ministries are already a part of these things. Um, it's just that you probably don't know about them. And they have access to a pocket of people that are usually not reached out by campus ministries um, that you can easily leverage um, yeah, a student's platform or a student's membership um, in any of these types of spaces. Uh, so um, you have academic and educational orgs. You have community service organizations. Um, IJM, International Justice Mission, is on UT's campus as a student org. Um, and a lot of students in our ministry are involved with IJM. Uh, so when it comes to even them partnering with so many law students who also care about social justice, we're able to have proximity with them and give them the gospel, give them the fuller picture of uh, justice and mercy meeting at the cross, um, which is so cool. Uh, media and publication orgs, political or multicultural organizations, recreation and sports organizations, student government organizations, religious and spiritual organizations. There's so many different types of organizations on campus that some of your people might be a part of or you may want to encourage them to be a part of, uh, to have a mi missional outreach um, uh, and missional presence uh, with a specific group. Um, but a lot of times we forget about some of these um, types of groups on our campuses. So, um, okay, so uh, towards the end right now, uh, I think that this was a lot of information, and honestly, my breakout is just more of like wanting to engage your heart on this, uh, and I definitely want us to talk about practical things. I'm going to have a few practical steps, but um, sometimes I think we just need to sit with the scriptures that God has already given us and actually process who are the um, people that we pursue the fastest, who are the people that maybe come to talk to you after a sermon or something like that. Um, after you kind of run an event or you kind of see them from far away and you're like, all right, I'm going to go to the bathroom now. Like, who are the people that you just kind of want to run away from? Who in your mind deserves your time? Then who in your mind wastes your time? And so with the scriptures that we just talked about and with these processing questions, I just want to give you a few minutes to just Think about what does that mean for you? What does all of this, all these passages, all these things we've talked about, what does that mean for you?
um, a few next steps that, um, like I said, these are these are a little general because I don't want to kind of like put you guys in a box because of the Holy Spirit being in you, but also um, your different contexts and cultures where you do ministry. But um, just a few things, pursue, create, and let loose. Pursue, um, choose a type of student organization and or a forgotten group um, to pursue this upcoming school year. Like what does it mean for you to intentionally focus on just one group, like one type of person? Um, sometimes that's personality too. Um, like some of our ministries, like we, we may not know it, but may be prone to um, bring in a certain type of personality. Could be really bubbly, could be really stoic and cynical. Like it could be something like, I don't know. Um, but that must mean that there's something about our culture that doesn't want to interact with maybe its opposite. Um, so even when it comes to personalities, um, what does it mean for us to um, go after or focus on maybe a group of people that we don't usually do that for? Um, so yeah, and remember, you can't do everything, but you can do something. Um, and then create. Create a culture that includes the forgotten. Create a culture um, that includes people on the margin. So uh, one thing my old college pastor always said was that words build worlds. Um, so in like developing different things like axioms and stuff like that, like one thing that we had started saying um, was to, to create a, more, a better culture of inclusion was that no one stands alone, no one sits alone. So, and that was based off the fact that Jesus taught us out when we were strangers, so we're gonna do the same. Um, and that's something that we've said over and over and over and over and over again to where it's a part of our DNA. So what are maybe things like that? And what maybe you can reassess, like what are the culture things that you have already? What are things that you say often? Um, do they actually move people into the margins and to the other? Or do they keep people kind of inside in their own groups? Um, and then last but not least, let loose. Um, let loose, and this is what I mean. Um, and I said it a couple times, but like, man, God is already working in your different students. Um, I don't know what it is about each generation, uh, younger and younger and younger, um, but like what I see in our students right now is that they want to um, impact the world and they want to um, meet needs and they want to go to the margins. So, like, what does it mean for us to actually fan the flame of what God is actually doing in our hearts? Like, if you're soon in here, what does it mean for you to actually take initiative to go to the margins yourself and then bring your friends with you and make that discipleship? Um, and so, for those of you in here who are, like, ministry staff, like, you know, according to Ephesians 4, like, your job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ. What does it mean for you to let your people loose? Let your people go towards the people that they feel an ache for and a heart for. In the last breakout session, there was a girl who even talked about a girl that she was discipling, how, yeah, she's been a little inconsistent, like when it comes to kind of attending things and isn't consistent with her quiet times, but has this kind of like, like inkling and ache for um, international students on their campus. And she was like, but what do I do with that? She's not consistent, but also she wants to do this. I'm like, what if like you guys start praying for the unreached pe person of the day through the Joshua app? What if that was part of y'all's discipleship and spiritual formation? And what if like you walked with her as she's doing those things, but just let her loose? Because sometimes when we add weight to the bench and give, empower people to do more of the things that they're called to do, the work of ministry, then they also grow. Um, they grow spiritually. They grow with time in their word and growing and learning what dependence on Jesus is. Um, so I'm not saying replace intimacy with Jesus with doing a bunch of things, but I'm just saying um, that can be a part of people's discipleship. So maybe there's people in your minds that are like, oh, they always ask, could we do this? Could we do that when it comes to serving or reaching people? But maybe you've like low-key put them in a box. Um, I wonder if that's like fizzling them out. I wonder if that's 
you know, stopping the flame um, or hurting that flame that God has already put on our hearts. Um, so let them loose. Um, I think that that's one of the more loving things we can do. Um, and you just step back and see like how your ministry and church change. Um, so again, these were like kind of general um, lanes um, as next steps. But what I want to do is just pray for you guys. And then um, I'm just going to open the time up to a little Q&A. Also, I may like ask you guys to answer each other's questions because like just to let you know, I do not have all the answers. I'm still learning, growing in this area. Uh, I want to be more like Jesus too, um, but I want it to be more of a workshop discussion type vibe. Um, and then we'll be good to go. Okay. All right. Uh, Father, thanks for, um, yeah, coming to, um, to this world um, that we made broken, um, that we made fallen to redeem us and rescue us. Um, ask that you would help us to continue to remember those things and for that to never get old. God, help us to never graduate from the gospel. And help us to apply the gospel in such a way to where um, we remember that it came to us because it is going to someone else. That it came to us so that we can go um, to all people and give this message away. Um, That help us also position our lives like your son, Jesus, where he was always around people um, that the rest of the culture and society deem not worthy. God, I say you just help us to wrestle with what it means to have that type of heart, what it means to maybe partner with different student organizations, what it means to really leverage um, and steward um, our current students well, what it means to really be on mission and seek out different marginalized peoples. God, I say you just give us your heart that maybe to the rest of the world, Some people would be forgotten, but to your church, they wouldn't. God, help us to do that because you never forgot about us. You never will. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Um, So yeah, um, Q&A or even your own thoughts or for me, like I'm really chill about this time. And um, so yeah, would love to just hear from you guys or even understand kind of like those things on your campus. Yeah. Uh, how do you identify like uh, forgotten group, and then how do you like get into that forgotten group? Yeah. Student on campus. Yeah. On what campus are you at? Uh, I'm here for work. Okay. TCU. Okay. So TCU. Um, do you do you? Um, so I know there. are So I, I thought about including something like this in where I just kind of walk through generally for us like what it means to um, look at maybe the different student organizations or different. Uh, types of Christian parachurch organizations and churches like on our campus and figure out who are they already reaching. Um, and so I don't know too much about TCU. I, I did speak at uh, Exodus, Exodus, yeah, this past year, which was fun. Um, so I got to know TCU a little bit, but, um, and I met a lot of sorority and fraternity people um, who are part of Exodus, I think. Um, so from face value, I just wonder what it means for someone to not be connected to fraternity and sorority. And I um, also know there's STUMO here, too. And one of their goals is to reach fraternities and sororities, too. Um, so I wonder, you know, what students who are just in regular social clubs and social groups are doing. So for us, um, an example is that, um, yeah, like we have we have groups like STUMO. We have groups like Reaching the Greek Like Sumo. Um, we have, um, like I said, my wife works for an organization under crew called Athletes in Action. Um, and they're reaching athletes. We have FCA. They're reaching athletes. We have another organization. They're reaching athletes. Um, but uh, based on all the different organizations I know, kind of crossing out the different types of people that they're reaching and wondering who's left. And usually, like, no one, like, cares about, I mean, and, like, I'm saying this in the best way possible, because uh, we went uh, on a spring break trip to Memphis where we uh, um, spent time, like, doing church planning and racial justice and all that stuff. And um, one one of the things the guy, um, one of the guys was saying at a specific minister was like, hey, like, 
if you're a nerd, like stay a nerd, like you stay out of trouble. And I was like, that's a word. Like, so every time it was like, come on nerds. Uh, but like, yeah, like a lot of people don't, don't think about the nerds, man. Um, and there are people who are going to be starting businesses and who are going to be um, around so many different types of people who are forgotten about because they may not have the same type of social access um, currently in their college careers. Um, so I wonder what that means for y'all. Um, like fraternities and sororities do a lot of events during like, you know, the first several weeks of school. Um, where's everybody else at? Um, uh, also, another big thing is that um, on a lot of bigger campuses, uh, there are um, minority fraternities and sororities too. Um, so if that's something new to y'all, y'all could just look up on your campuses, like who, like what groups are they? Um, and there's probably not people like working to reach them, um, especially in churches. Um, so I think different things like that. So maybe like from the top of your head, all the different groups that you know of, like maybe assess to the best of your knowledge, who are they reaching? Um, you can even talk with them and meet with them and ask them. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think by process of elimination, you'll figure out uh, these people are generally not targeted or forgotten. So hopefully, hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. How do you go about reaching those? Uh, it's a two-part question, I guess those who have been hurt by the church, and second part would be those who have been hurt by the church that you're serving. Mm. Dang, bro. Bro, this is a whole new breakout session. <laughs> like, church hurt. <laughs> church hurt. I actually did a, I know, I feel like I'm a breakout session guy at this point. I did a, um, I did a uh, deconstruction and church hurt breakout session at something in Nashville. And um, because that, that was like a big, that's a big question. And being an Austin, Texas boy, everybody, every, everybody has doubts and people are like, dude, I don't really care about church. And so I feel like we're around so many types of people, um, who, uh, have experienced church hurt and, uh, just don't want to, um, don't want to engage at all. Um, and so, I'll say a couple things, and this is not like I do not like advertise like advertising myself at all. Uh, but we did a podcast on um, on church hurt. Um, what I do when I'm hurt by the church or something like that. It's on a podcast that we did during a pandemic um, called the Green Room. Uh, I say the word room weird because yeah, you know it's just it's just me. Uh, but the Green Room, uh, it's college at the Austin Stone. Um, it was a limited podcast series we did because we wanted to have more proximity to our students who are mostly doubters and struggling with a lot of questions like that. Um, so uh, that's a really good, like, I think it's like 40, 50 minutes long, just me and a couple of our pastors just talking about it. And I take actual questions from students um, and actually ask them those things. Um, and there's a lot of other resources that um, I can totally recommend from like other people too, uh, from doing research for that. But um, what I've seen serve the people who've been hurt by the church is um, by, by personal, like, invitations of belonging to things that are not church. Um, so what I mean by that, like, like what does it mean? Like, if they, if they hate church or don't want to go to church, but I have a relationship with them, are they still, like, in my life? Am I inviting them into my life? Um, because if they're not going to go to a church building, um, and if they're not going to go to a church building, but they feel safe around me, then I need to find a space where, um, I can be with them and continue to like share Jesus with them and like help them kind of recover a feeling of safety, um, when it comes to, um, who they identify, um, as church people. But that's just from my own experience. Um, and then people have been hurt by the church in our own church. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, and church hurt can span from, Hey, somebody then say hi to me, like on the way to my small group type of thing. Like, Oh, like they never greet me here. It's like, it could, it could span from that. It's been all the way to, I mean, things of abuse and worse. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to speak onto the abuse side. Uh, I think that that's like a whole nother ball game. 
Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot there that, um, I don't necessarily feel equipped to, uh, cover in a setting like this, but I think everything else where it's like, man, like I was not seen, um, or, um, I was not loved, like I was not responded to, or, um, even messy conflict in situations like that. If someone's a part of our church, but was hurt by our church, uh, one of the things like, I like to tell our students that conflict, when we talk about conflict resolution at the beginning of the school year at like a leader retreat, uh, we talk about the fact the matter is that when Jesus talks about church discipline, that church discipline actually starts with like community being real with each other. So church discipline doesn't start with like, oh, we need to bring this like to the elders. Like it actually starts by us being real with each other and having conflict in day-to-day life. Um, so a lot of times for us, what we've seen is that people forget that like that um, we it's okay for us to have conflict and still remain a family. Um, like a lot of our students struggle with forgiving other students for like not like not like things that are over here, but like kind of petty things sometimes. Like I can never be in the same room with this person. And it's like yo, that's a like that's a like foundational aspect of receiving the gospel is forgiving like your your friends, forgiving especially your enemies even. It's like if Jesus says to love your enemies and you can't forgive like your roommate for not washing dishes for a month, then like there's a there's a foundational problem. And I understand, yeah, like, you know, there's conversations, all that stuff. And roommate keeps doing it. But like there should still be forgiveness there. And so for us, what we do is really walk with our students through some of those basic like principles, like what does forgiveness actually mean um, and how do we actually practice it? Um, but again, there's so many different types of church hurt situations that um, I feel like it's going to be hard for me to kind of answer that question without like pigeonholing it. Um, but uh, but yeah, have a lot more thoughts on that podcast still, but also um, a good book it's by a guy named AJ Soboda called After Doubt. Um, it's on the construction um, and I think the sub kind of title is like how to, how to, you know, have your faith without losing it or something like that. Um, so that book's on deconstruction. Um, and if you search AJ Swoboda, he has a lot of different podcasts and different things like that. Um, it's AJ, I think Swoboda is spelled S-W-O-B-O-D-A, Swoboda. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah. So sorry, sorry maybe if that wasn't particularly helpful, but um, we do have a lot of people who've been hurt by the church Um um, or by a church. Uh, the last thing I'll say is like, it's really important that we understand like, what does that mean? Um, because I think that that's like kind of a big general term right now or a big, a big phrase. Like I've been hurt by the church. Um, and just for all of us to continue to ask like, okay, what does that mean? Um, and getting to the bottom of, okay, who hurt you? Um, what setting or environment were you hurt in? Um, and a lot of times it goes back to just feeling forgotten and not being seen, not being loved, um, not being valued. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Question. Okay. Because I actually do have a passion for this, uh, but I know it's so nuanced. When you're reaching, say, minority groups with different cultural backgrounds, how do you like reach them but not make them feel like you're trying to fit them into another mm, goal, like you really respect that's them? That's so good. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, a lot of times on our way to wanting to be like a, a environment or church or a culture of all nations, like we can do a lot more hurting and helping. Um, uh, one of the things that, um, when I first came to Austin, one of the main things like I... Um, try to do is just bless like people and bless like campus orgs without like asking for anything else uh, like back. Um, I think sometimes when it comes to like all of our toil in ministry, like, oh, like we're working so hard to reach these groups, but they're not coming to anything. Like what if we like went in with more of a, um, more of a posture of like, we just want to give away and bless and like, like it's okay if we don't receive anything. Um, I think that really changes the idea for us of like what it means for us to like bring people into like our places, our spaces. And because maybe 
um, you can lead someone to Christ, but maybe they don't end up at your church. Um, I think knowing that that's the big win, um, going and loving and caring and giving away to um, different groups that don't look like you uh, with fully open hands. Um, I know that that's really hard. A lot of this conversation is really hard because like our churches and like just the culture, the environments like want to see success, right? Like that's the whole thing about reaching the chief and then getting an entire tribe. So you spend all your time like trying to reach the chief, but the chief never comes or whatever. I don't know. Um, or the chief comes, but it was all just kind of a show or something like that. You can really risk a lot. Um, and it could feel like it's wasted time at the end of the day. Um, but I want to promise you when like you go and you bless people, like I mean, we're, we're blessed to be a blessing. Like that's part of biblical like narrative, right? That, that we can also give things away without expecting something back. Um, that we're still also called to do that. Um, so I think a good, Thing for you to process is like, how do you want to bless those groups? Um, how can you show the love of Christ and be in spaces where you can share the love of Christ, but also know that you're content with just Jesus? Um, I think that those are good things for all of us to wrestle with. Um, like, what if like God, like, you know, we go and do all of this and we never see another disciple made or our church numbers don't like grow or anything like that. Like, would we still be okay? Um, and so, I don't know, just some things to consider. Uh, for, for me specifically, um, when it comes to being at, uh, you know, Texas Tech, pri- primarily white institution, um, and for me being at Texas Tech, um, being one of the, like, minorities on campus who, like, was a part of a predominantly white church, and, um, but also, like, my fraternity was a black fraternity. Um, and so I had, like, kind of a foot in both worlds. Um, I, I think that if you do have students, um, who are, um, who are, like, non white, um, at your church, um, even helping them, like, in love and in wisdom as a shepherd, like, process what it means for them to, like, reach people who also look like them. Because sometimes the people that we have in our majority white churches um, start to become, like, they start thinking missionally homogenous like us. Yeah. Like, oh, dang, like, we're just going to, like, yeah, like, I'm just going to hang out with, like, majority white people. And this is kind of my crew, and I'm never going to think about, like, I don't know, it just becomes the same. Um, so that's just more of a challenge, um, specifically the white brothers and sisters in this room. It's like, man... Like, what does it mean for us to even empower those, like, few minorities that maybe you have, or maybe you have a lot, like, but whoever you have, to empower them um, to love and reach um, those who look like them. Um, And uh, preface for all of this, too, I don't don't mean to say, like, hey, ignore the Greek people. Um, Hope hope you guys know that. I'm not saying any of this to say ignore, like, um, majority cultures or the people that everyone's reaching. Um, but, uh, I'm wanting to more so highlight the fact that we ignore, um, the groups that, uh, Jesus thinks about a lot. Um, like we actually forget about them, but hopefully that's helpful. Um, some next steps, but, um, so yeah, I, guys, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss y'all, but, um, I'll be here for a little bit if you want to talk or ask a question or something like that. Also, my email is just Mitchell at austinstone.org. Uh, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L, two L's. Um, that gets people in trouble sometimes because email bounce back. But uh, Mitchell with two L's at Austin Stone, S-T-O-N-E, dot org. Um, appreciate you guys. Thanks for being here. Um, see you later.